like I would try to tell a joke and they'd be like, ha, <laughs> I got flustered. And I just went, hey, go ahead and keep heckling me in the back. I said, I'm only 20 years old. I've been drinking in this all night. Why don't I call the cops and shut this place down? What? The mic went off, the lights went off, two dudes picked me up and threw me out the front door. And this dude goes, never come back. If I'm trying to meet black girls, I'm not going to a Garth Brooks concert. I don't know. I was just basically my, my right. was like, this is what we like. And I looked at it like, this is what we doing. Let's ride. What's your go-to recipe or what do you bring to the cookout? Me? Yes. Water. Dude, I would, man, I would cuddle with them. With Joe Burrow? Yeah. We're not going to do nothing, but I'd cuddle with them. Just talk. That's it. That's how much I love Joe Burrow. <laughs> Appreciate you for tuning in in this episode of Funky Friday. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this. And if you're feeling really funky, leave a comment. Enjoy the show. Yo, what's good? What's popping? What it is, what it ain't, what it could be, what it should be, what it will be. Cam Newton, the son, Mr. Boogie, they all here to give another episode of Funky Friday. And I promise to give good content for the masses, but I also promise to keep it funky for your asses. Now, today is a person I've been a fan of for so long and I'm honored to have him in our presence. He is an actor. He is a stand-up comedian. He is a person of many talents that I wish we could switch the culture of ethnicities to somebody we really don't want in our dog on ethnicity. I present to some and introduce to others, Mr. Gary Owen. Thank you. Not Owens. Was that a dig on Jason Whitlock? No. Look at him. Through that one. You loop. did. That was, a, that was an easy one. That was a layup. That was a layup. You feel me? Uh, so, yeah, let's get right into it as far as you've been in this industry for a long time. Yeah. Uh, 20, 25 years? 25. Yeah. Going, growing through it, like, what was your first recollection of coming into this uh, comedic industry? <sighs> it's weird. Like, I always knew I was going to be a comedian mm -hmm. growing up. But you grow, in a, grow up in a small town in Ohio, you don't know how. You're just like, I would watch anything on TV was stand-up. Any If I saw stand-up on TV, I would just stop and watch. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I, this is what I'm going to do. But how do you do it? There's no comedy clubs in the trailer park. <laughs> Not even around it. So I was like, so what I did was I thought all of California was L.A. Because back in the 80s, David Lee Roth had that song called... Um, California girls, mm -hmm. you know? And the Beach Boys had it in the 60s. But so he's, he didn't say LA girls, he said California girls. Right. So I watched that music video and I said, oh, California. Obviously, you're thinking Hollywood. I didn't know there was a Fresno, a Bakersfield, Ooh. an Oakland. I just right. thought. So I was like, how can I get to California? And I was like, Navy. The Navy has all the bases in California. Ooh. So I was like, I'll join the Navy. And if they can get me to California, then I can start doing stand up. So I joined the Navy, and the first two years I was in Washington, D.C., I was in a presidential honor guard. So Ooh. we did the parades and the funerals here at Arlington and stuff. So I did that for two years, and then I became a police officer in the Navy. So what? I went to the police academy in San Antonio, Texas, and then they said, where do you want to get stationed? I was like, Cal San Diego, California. Ooh. I'm thinking San Diego's L.A. Right. So I got out there my first day when I got to California. I said, okay, I'm here. Time to start this second career. Right. I get in the phone book. I look up this place called Comic Castle. I thought it was a comedy um, store type place, right? right? I thought it was a comedy club. So I said, hey, man, I get on the phone. I go, hey, you got open mic? And he goes, let me check. And he leaves. I go, let me check. He comes back and goes, I can't find it. I go, what, what do you mean you can't find it? I called a comic book store thinking it was a comedy club, hey, and he, he was looking for, for a, a superhero uh, called Open Mike. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> so I said, what? But the guy was cool. We got on the phone, he goes, what, what are you looking for? I said, I'm a comedian, man. I'm, I'm a comedian I'm looking you for a comedy club. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, Look, here, call this number. So he gave me the number to the comedy store, and I kept calling, took a couple weeks, mm -hmm. but I finally got on one of the Open mic nights, and um, that didn't go that great. And then uh, what happened was, I thought, and I ain't lying, I was in the mirror that night before I went up, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna get discovered. 
You know, I'm still not registering. This is open mic. Nobody's gonna be there but eight people. I'm All thinking six. I'm thinking. Eddie Murphy's there. I'm thinking, you know, Chevy Chase is there. I'm like, oh, right, they right. all there. No, it's San Diego on Sunday. Nobody's there. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember people had to, more people at the beach than the obviously. I know, right? Yeah. And I just remember it was Sunday. And by the time I got on stage, there's probably six, seven people in the audience, but there was like 10 comics in the back. And the comics start heckling me. Not heckling like they don't like me. They were just like, like, I would try to tell a joke, and they'd be like, ha! <laughs> but I'm back. not to the punchline yet. Right, I'm like, right, dude, they're right. messing up my train of thought. Right. And I was like, I got flustered, and I just went, hey, <laughs> yo, go ahead and keep heckling me in the back. I said, I'm only 20 years old. I had a bottle of beer. I said, I've been drinking in this all night. Why don't I call the cops and shut this place down? What? When I tell you, the mic went off, the lights went off, two dudes picked me up. It was like out of a movie. Picked me up back and threw me out the front door. What? And this dude goes, never come back. Oh, so I dusted God. myself off and I go, okay, okay. I can't come back here, but I can talk. So it hit me like I can talk. I'm so, good at that. I'm good at that. So that's, that's what really started it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just would... I would hit all the the black spots in Cincinnati because mm -hmm. I was at that point. Now I'm on, at my duty station, and I would tell people, "Man, I'm trying to be a comedian. Man, I don't know where to go around here." So the brothers would always tell me, "Yo, you can come here, here, here," because there's always a comedy night in the hood, right? Somewhere, but you had to be willing to go to the hood, right? So I was like, I just want to make people laugh. Right. So I couldn't get up at the quote unquote white rooms, so I go to the black rooms, right. and I was the one white guy that would show up, and I started to make a a little name for myself in San Diego, and then they had the, this contest. Z90 was a hip hop station. They said, we're looking for the funniest black comedian in San Diego. So I entered, I didn't say I was white, because back then you just do a radio call in. Right. I called the radio station, I got on, won it, and first prize, you got to audition for Comic View, which is up, and you, know, you had to go to LA. So now I'm realizing, oh, okay. At this point I know all of California is not LA. Right. So I. Got off work one day, drove up to LA, auditioned for Comic View, got on the show, and then it just kind of took off from there. I'm doing stand up and I'm in the military at the same time. Mm. I was on Comic View and in the Navy at the same time. A lot of people don't know this. Right. Because they used to film the whole season in a week. They do like five episodes a day, right. Monday through Friday. They get 25 episodes in a one week. So I just took a week off, took my leave, went up to LA, filmed, came back down. So literally, like, I'm a police officer on the base. So at some point, I'm on the gate, and I'm waving cars on the base. And now and then, every now and then, her brother will pull on the base and be like, hey, were you on TV last night? Hey, yeah, yeah, have a good day. Keep going, player. <laughs> <laughs> so Damn. just kind of, I, I became the host, got out of the Navy, and just that's when the career kind of blossomed, I guess, right. after that. But that process, obviously, you tell, you tell it in, in, in a span of paragraphs, but... That's a long time. It's a it, like you invested so much the belief in yourself, you know what I'm saying, to that. Um, like take me through that whole time frame where we talking about a month, we talking about two years, we talking about years. You know, it was uh it, it came pretty fast because that okay, so that time that I went on stage and, and got kicked out of the comedy store, it took like probably six months before I got back on stage because I just didn't know where else to go. Right. So the course of that six months was when I would get to know people on the base because I'm new to the city. Right. I'm getting, to, I'm like the new kid in high school when you get on a ship or on a base. Right. So it takes a while to make friends and to trust people. So that was probably six months before I got back on stage. So it was probably, this was all within the first year of after I finally got on stage to, to win in that contest yeah. was about a year. And then Comic View was probably Six months later. So I was probably doing stand-up about a year and a half. Yeah. This, that whole time frame is about a year and a half. How did you build, or I think it's an ongoing thing, but how did you build your, your content? You know what I'm saying? Because the thing about comedians is not only are you a therapist to the degree that you got to walk into a room of strangers and you got to tap into this comedic sign or make people laugh when they already know that, okay, what the hell he got to do or what is he going to bring out of me that, you know, some people get the laughs or ha, 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 yeah, uh -huh, the chuckle, but I'm talking about funny, funny, funny. You know what I mean? Like, do you, 
do you dive into your personal life? Do you dive into this fantasy world? You know, it's almost like a rapper. Like, is what you're talking about real versus a facade? I think for me, everything I'm talking about is real. It's just adding like HGH and steroids to it. <laughs> I'm just adding a little extra to make it better. Right. You know what I mean? And that's that's really what it is. I've never like told a lie on stage. I don't do weed jokes because I'm not a weed expert. Mm -hmm. I don't do like quote unquote drug type jokes because mm. I just I don't that's not my world and I've seen comedians we, we call them uh, comedy liars right they be like they'll tell stories like you don't do that yeah. like you know what I mean it'd be like um like me sleeping with white women I would never tell a joke about that because it doesn't happen you don't <laughs> but who like this is this is what I want to know how did you feel so comfortable with tapping into a I don't know another this is me. I don't know another white person who's more comfortable with being in the presence of black people and use that as like, yo, my black friend. It's like when certain people say it, it's like, okay, cool. But it's like, you're stamped. Like your obvious experiences in the culture has given you context to be able to, you know, share with the world. I just always been very, I've been comfortable with my own skin. Mm -hmm. So I never felt like I had to um, like, I, you know, it, I'll put it like this. If you like black girls, mm -hmm. you got to go to black shit. <laughs> I, I, if I'm trying to meet black girls, I'm not going to a Garth Brooks concert. I'm going to go to Summer Jam. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you, I, I think initially, even before I was doing stand-up, man, like I would hang out with all the black guys in the Navy because they, they, they did things I like to do. Yeah. You know, I, I like to play pickup basketball. I liked... I just like music. I like banging. No, I like country music. Yeah. I like rock music, but I wouldn't go to the concert. You know, I listened to it. I liked it. But where did this come from, though? This is like I've met multiple people that are Caucasians, right? And I'm like, bro, you ever been with a black girl? No. And I meet a lot of black dudes and be like, hey, yo, bro, like, you ever been with a white girl or dated a white girl? You know what I'm saying? No. What pushed you to this? I want to try to talk to a, a black girl. I, this is gonna sound odd. I always say it's probably like, to me it was like being gay. Like gay guys know they're gay. Mm. They don't know why they're gay. They're just gay. Mm. I don't know. I was just basically my, my right. was like, this is what we like. And I looked at it like, this is what we doing. This Let's ride. <laughs> That's basically you what ready, bro? <laughs> Why fight it? Let's go. Uh, always, uh, but it was weird. Like, always, I, I didn't go to school with a lot of black women. Mm. My school was probably white. Um, I, I don't know. But you're saying Cincinnati, Ohio, or Ohio as a whole is not a state that you'd be like, bro, it's a lot of black people there. Now, granted, there's a lot of black people everywhere. Yeah. But it's like, at what age did you understand, like, yo, bro? Oh, I was young, bro. I'm talking like different strokes. <sighs> Good times, you know, facts of life. I was looking at Tootie, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Though let's not even get on Janet Jackson. Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a, yeah. I don't know. So, like, as you're growing up, right? Not only just from that culture dynamic, um, who did you who did you look up to, or who inspired you the most for you to identify, like, bro, I want to I want to rock with this this comedian. I would say, I wouldn't say it's one comedian. I would say when, when I saw Def Comedy Jam the first time, I was in high school. Mm. I had never seen a crowd. One, I'd never seen a, 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 someone like Martin just literally go in on people. Personally, just right. And, and like, I'm talking like hard when he said that, uh, you know, when he said the one about somebody, MC Light, and he goes, and I'm there. And the crowd went nuts when he first said it. I said, like, oh, he's going to he's gonna die. Yeah. And then everybody just started laughing. I went, oh, wow, yeah. this isn't personal. Yeah. And just seeing, like, Bernie Mac on there and just, I mean, all the greats. And I was like, that's the reaction I want. Yeah. I didn't want the, uh, mm -hmm. I like him, like, moving out right. their seats. Right. type. Because I always say, like, the biggest difference between white audiences and black audiences is it's the it's the whole extreme. Mm -hmm. You'll never bomb that bad in a white audience. Mm. 
but you also won't get the love from a white audience. So it's like the extreme on both sides. And I think a lot of white comics, when I was coming up, they went, when, even when I got to LA, I was doing all the black rooms because mm-hmm. that's who knew me. You know, Guy Tory gave me my first shot at Fat Tuesdays. And man, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, everybody was at Fat Tuesday. Mm. Everybody. I mean, you, you, there, it wouldn't be a night. You see Denzel there. You see mm. Kobe there. You see Shaq. You see everybody was there. Really? You know, I got, I got my first movie because Jamie Foxx was there. Mm. You know, so he's like, you never knew who was in the audience. But I think a lot of the white comics wouldn't do it. Because they, I think they would see Def Jam. They would see Showtime at right. the Apollo. And that was probably intimidating. Right. To me, it was like, oh. I, I always looked at it like, if I could do the Apollo, man, if I can make them laugh, yeah. I'm good. But like, I, what I'm hearing is you didn't want to be safe, right? Because safe is two, two different sides. Like, when you're safe, you're that person that's, okay, yeah, yeah. But when you're not, it's just like, bro, you either got some lovers that's like dying about your content or it's just like, oh, I just don't like them. So much so that I'm like David Chappelle, right? And even recently, uh, Chris Rock, right? When you, when, when you use comedy, the state of comedy now is, it's still an art, right? It's a form of expression, but it's still a, from a joking matter. I, 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 Seeing a person like Richard Pryor use comedy to inform people, you know what I'm saying, about the insufficiencies of humanity, right? And he was slipping in strategically, and obviously you see David Chappelle do it too. You know, his the art of his storytelling is something that I love to admire, but do you think the state of comedy is too serious now? I mean, it can be, but I think if you go to a live show, like, if you really go to a comedy club, mm-hmm. nothing's changed. I think we're so caught up in social media and the internet, we think it's hindering comedians, mm. and you think we're tailoring our acts towards that, whether it's too political or can't say what we want to say. I think that's why we've gotten to the point where you got to put your phones away, because you don't want somebody taking a, a 30 second thought of an eight minute joke yeah. and posting it, and then you know people just, and the thing about the internet too is the people that really get upset, like they were never gonna pay to see me anyways. That's a fact. I'm always like this. I, if you send me a DM or a message and you came to my show and you paid money to see me, I'll respond to you. Mm-hmm. Cause you, don't, you invested your time and money in me. The least I could do is respond to you. Whether you, 90% of it is good, mm-hmm. but every now and then you'll strike a chord with somebody that ain't like that or something. Right. Doesn't have a lot, but I'll, I'll respond to those people. If you're just going in, you and you didn't come see me live, you're going off a clip yeah. or an interview, I go, you're not a fan? Yeah. So I, you're, so who's, I don't care about so your opinion. Now, and I have to ask it from a teenage perspective, because they see comedy now as the Instagram clip or um, like I look at a guy like Desi Banks, mm-hmm. right? Extremely funny. He has this funny way of expressing you know, the reality of a hood dude, right? Yeah. Uh, Drewski, another uh, a, a person who is extremely educated, articulate, and he personifies like everybody knows that guy that they portray, right? Coming up in this day and age where you have social media versus when you was coming up, you didn't have, it was word of mouth, you know what I'm saying? You ever heard of this dude named Gary oh, Who? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's the benefits of, of both and, or the benefits of both, and what's the negative or the things that you have to warrant yourself from the other? See, when you bring up someone like Desi Banks or Drewski, it's like those type of guys, and it sounds crazy me being older than them, they inspire me mm. because they, when I was coming up, we, we didn't have the independence. We couldn't just like get our jokes and then build a fan base. Now with Instagram, YouTube, they're not, quote unquote, they don't need the machine, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. They're doing it on their own and like the machine's coming to them. So when I see stuff like that, I'm like, dang. I was like, I just, I wish it was around when I first started. Right. But I, I see Desi all the time and I'm like, when I tell him, I said, I always make sure I message him and everything. I just tell him, you're killing it, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's really is, it's some inspiring stuff to, to think, because my road manager met Desi Banks at Smoothie King. He used to work at Smoothie King. What? And he was like, he would tell my road manager, like, yeah, I'm trying to do this stand-up thing and doing sketches and stuff. And when we, he started to pop, my road manager was like, yo, 
that guy was a smoothie king. He used to make me smoothies. So to hear stories like that, I'm not one of these quote unquote OGs that are like, yeah, you know, they just they ain't real stand ups and all that shit. Look, man, if you can find a way to build a fan base, all respect to you. And you can sell tickets Mm -hmm. and you can make money and provide a living. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it like, okay, how can I piggyback off that? Yeah. You know, because last time I was in Atlanta, I mean, I I called Desi and we did a couple sketches together Mm -hmm. just because I want to be a part of that. Right. You know what I mean? And it's fun. And it was cool because he literally just made a bunch of phone calls and all these comics that are up and coming, they all just showed up to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's like that fraternity that a lot of people don't see. They see comedians and we go at each other and we'll be arguing and that'll get all the clicks. But Mm -hmm. they don't realize what really a a tight-knit group it is. You know, We really do support each other for the most part. I've seen it. Uh, Like those uh, brainstorming events where like all of them kind of hey, this would be funny. No, that wouldn't be funny. But if you add this dynamic to that, and obviously he brings a different side, she may bring a different side, and then obviously you add a different person uh, from a different dynamic, you know, that's that's art. You know what I'm saying? But you would say, or not you, but some would say, they're doing it in an unconventional way. Because a lot of these guys who are funny, they don't have no experience with stand-up. It's yeah. a different, it is a different beast. You know what I'm saying? And the, the, the big difference is, um, as far as comedy clubs, they don't care if you're funny or not. They just want to know if you can put asses in the seats. Mm-hmm. So they will, they will book some unfunny people. Right. But if they can sell tickets, they'll still book them. But does, it, they, help, does it help or hurt their brand, though? It, that's, a, that's a touchy one because I'm never one to, like, criticize somebody. Mm-hmm. Because when you get someone like Desi or a Drewski or a Jess Hilarious... You gotta realize a lot of their fans in the beginning, they're probably people that never went to a comedy show. Mm-hmm. So they got nothing to compare it to. So when they see someone like Desi, he's finding his voice on stage, but they're not like, oh, he, yeah, he's, he's rough around the edges right now. Mm-hmm. No, nah, they're like, this is the funniest I've ever seen in my life. Right, right, you know what right. I mean? So the only disadvantage is um, they're finding their voice with pressure. Mm. We were just open micing. Right. I, I, could, I could bomb a thousand times, nobody know about it. Right. Desi bombs, Drewski everybody, bombs, yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. gonna know. Right. And that's, that's the pressure. But the advantage is they're not going in front of hostile crowds. Mm-hmm. They're going in front of their fans. But when you when you explain it like a hostile crowd, give me a description or like an example of that. Try Okay. <laughs> Try to go up and nobody knows you, right? Mm-hmm. And you're... You're going up. There used to be some legendary hood clubs. There was like the Comedy Act Theater in LA. I heard in Atlanta there was 557. There was um there was one in New Jersey, Peppermint Lounge. Mm. They said on those nights, man, they don't if they didn't know you, and <laughs> keep in mind, you might be going after monsters. Yeah. You might there there was nights in LA, man. The lineup, the open when I was coming up, the lineup would be Kevin Hart, Cat Williams. Aerie Spears, Cedric might pop in. What? You, Bernie might come. You were going against my, and you got to go last. What? Good luck. But, but. One, I'll tell you a funny story. One time I went up, it was, uh, I was early. Yeah. Chappelle went up right before me, right? Right before me. And these, these mother efforts. Right. I got up, they don't know me, I'm a white dude, I'm in a black room, and Chappelle just did like 30 minutes and killed, right? They, they didn't, I didn't, I couldn't get a joke out. And they they heckled me and heckled and wouldn't stop, right? The crowd is. The two dude, these two dudes heckled me in the beginning and wouldn't let up. But where it, were they? They were in the crowd? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Okay. You got right. The crowd's tired. Right. Uh, I'm going after three hours of stand-up. Mm-hmm. And I didn't get booed, but I didn't get a reaction either. Mm-hmm. It was just like I was fighting them the whole time, right? <laughs> so why this is how the karma works the next week it was monday night at the improv and we had a lot of regulars you had a lot of same customers i saw them and it was the same two dudes in the same seats so now i went up early yeah so my whole set was on them Ooh. and now the whole crowd is on my side because yeah. they're not tired and i'm a white dude came out gunning yeah came out me went after bah, them right bah. and i remember i closed i said hey last week i was here these two Heckle me. I go, right. heckle me now. Yeah. Uh, and drop the mic in the And the crowd went nuts. And to the dude's credit, they like, all oh, right, you got us. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, no yeah. anger. Right. So, I mean, that's just an example. Mm-hmm. Man. 
I miss those days though. But that's dope as hell. But it's the competition in that though. You know what I'm saying? And I think competition brings out the best in all of us in some degree. Um, but what's the normal, what's the normal kind of time frame you usually get when you go to like an improv, when you go to like a stand-up? Is it 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour? Like how did you build your stamina to be able to go? In the beginning, you're you're just you're lucky to get five minutes. Mm. In the beginning, you're open micing. And that's a long time when you're first starting. Right. Man, and then just the more you do it, when I came up, I came up San Diego, obviously, and then LA, you're lucky to get 10 minutes mm. at any point, right? And then you gotta get on the road. And then when you start getting on the road and opening for people, and then you features usually get 20 to 30 minutes. But man, when you get that first headlining gig and you gotta go up there for an hour, yeah. woo, my, my first hour special on BET, back in the day, Comic View, you would do, you, it was a contest. And you kept winning, do five minute sets, and you kept moving on. I kept moving on, end up winning, and then I got an hour special. But the hour special really was 45 minutes mm -hmm. because it's commercial breaks, right? So they said, we just need 45 minutes. If BET's got the footage, right. it's the slowest 45 minute special you have ever seen in your life, because I didn't have an hour, right? Mm -hmm. I, every joke, I waited till the last laughed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would pace the stage, and I kept looking at the clock like, oh. There's 20 minutes left. I'm about, I'm about to shop my load here. Right. It was a slow. I had a great closing joke, and I was just trying to get to it. Mm. And it was just it was just fluff. Are you a person that likes to see the time, or you just won't? I like to see it. I like to see the clock. That's pressure. Yeah. I like to see Well, nowadays, God, an hour's short. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, li I like the clock, because I like to know where I'm at, yeah. you know? And I, I did, though, I remember watching um, an interview with Louis C.K., mm -hmm. and he said sometimes he'll do his closer in the beginning because it'll push him to be funny. Because, you know, you, you always want that big send-off joke. Yeah. He said he'll flip it, and he, he'll do his strongest bit right off the bat. Set the tone. And then, because now it makes him work. Yeah. And I was like, oh. And I always, like, see guys like that, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to try that. And I like it, because it does challenge you. Yeah. I'll come out just guns a-blazing with the, <laughs> with the home run, yeah. and then be like, okay, now let's see where we're going from here. But uh, I love, that's, that's the beauty of comedy clubs. You can't do that at a theater. Yeah. You got thousands paying. When you get a couple hundred people, it's fun, man. Yeah. It's fun. Then how do you do, like, so obviously with five to 10 minutes, and this is the question that I got for me, like, how do you incorporate props? You know what I'm saying? Props? Like, when you got five minutes, you ain't got time for props outside of the mic. You know what, what do you saying? mean props? Like, you know, setting the, painting the picture. You feel what I'm saying? It's like, yo, I'm thinking, when you say props, I'm thinking Carrot Top. Carrot Top's whole act was pulling out of a trunk. And so when you say props, I'm like, what do you mean props? No, I'm saying props like building the storyline with like, yeah, so I'm driving down the street with the bicycle and then like you got to. Oh, you know, it, yeah. it just happens organically. I'm I've never written a joke down in my life on a piece of paper. What I can't. Who who? How do you like? It's like up here. It's not. I'm not. No, don't get it wrong. I'm not freestyling. Mm -hmm. It's not like every show. I just know my set in my brain, so I know it. So I just I don't write did down. You, did you did you go to school for that? Mm -mm. But how do you, how do you? Okay, anybody who's at Everest public speaking knows you got to get back on point. It's like, speaking is like driving. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're driving down the road, everything's smooth, you're comfortable. But what happens when a tree falls in front of you or like a defensive driver, or you get hecklers and say, shut yeah. the f up, you're not funny, boo. I love it. You know what I'm At saying? this stage of my career, I, it, it gets my adrenaline going. It, I think it keeps me young. Mm. All that, man. Please, if you like to come and heckle, please feel free. It just, man, it just, I, cause I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, um, how can I say it? Uh, I'm not, um, how can I word this? I'm not malicious. Okay. So if I get a heckler, I'm trying to have fun with them. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna call you out your name and a lot of other stuff, yeah. but in the end, I want us to come back together. Correct. I don't want to get a heckler and I have to kick them out. Yeah. But what if, what if nobody laughs? You can't judge that. You're not paying it. The people. Oh, are, so somebody's heckling me. No. And my response, nobody laughs. Right. Or you're saying a joke where it's like, you throw a punchline and it's not funny. 
You know what I'm saying? That doesn't happen a lot. Of course, but you had to get somewhere. You know, know what I'm saying? Like you're a funny dude. Like you got like archives of just killing it. But what I'm basically what I'm saying to my analogy of driving a car, like when you're in the median and you're like, damn, bro, like I gotta. All right, this one's gonna be tougher than normal. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about a flat crowd? Yeah. A flat crowd? Or any any what if situation. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It, it's case by case basis. And that's the thing. Once you've been doing it long enough, you kind of know how to get out of any situation. Wow. And you kind of know, like, you can get up on stage and be like, oh, yeah, this crowd's gonna make me work. Yeah. They're a little flat. Right. But that's that, sometimes you like it. Cause I like, if I can make this crowd finally come around, yeah. man. Cause sometimes I don't I don't like the you get too much love in the beginning. Mm. Where do you go from that? Like sometimes I'll 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 see the videos of Kev on, on tour mm -hmm. and you just announce his name and that crowd's going freaking ballistic. Yeah. And I'm like, I, in the back of my brain I go, it's kind of gotta suck because you're not gonna get a better right. response than the initial one. Mm -hmm. You know? So sometimes I like going up and it's just like. Yeah. I'm like, okay, let me clap. just build this the, up. The golf clap. Yeah, because that's, yeah, when I see videos and they'll, they'll post them, like, oh, man, that kind of that kind of sucks. Because there's just no way. There's not a joke he could tell mm -hmm. that's going to get that response, that initial, because he's such a mega movie star now. Right. I mean, he's a mega, just star. not even movie star, he's just a mega star. Right. So you got people that are coming to see a stand-up, but you got those people that are coming to just see the star that is Kevin Hart. You know what I mean? So they're just so excited. Yeah. They can't control themselves. Once you settle in, now they get to know him. Right. Now he's not untouchable. Now yeah. they're like, oh, I kind of relate I'm bonding with this guy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they still love him, still vibing with him, mm -hmm. but then they thought, oh, sh it's kind of like if you walked into Waffle House mm -hmm. at midnight, people might go nuts. Mm -hmm. Those same people that went nuts, you're still there at two o'clock. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's you just can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's just getting all star <laughs> right now. <laughs> Cover smothered in chunks. Right? You're yeah. like this. Nah, that's Cam. Man, I got a picture of him Face two, two hours ago. I ain't worried about yeah. him no more. Yeah. All right, bro. Let's get into it. So, Gary, you are treated as an honorary member of the black community. Today, you have a chance to co-sign for some of your Caucasian counterparts in a game called The Cookout Cosign. I will read some names. Choose between the names as to which should be allowed into the cookout and why. If neither should make it, just say that. Are you ready? Yes. You trying to burn bridges. I'm not. Here we go. First one's up. Justin Bieber and Justin Timberlake. Who's in and who's out? <clears throat> That's a hard one. They both married white women. Uh, I, would, ooh, I would say probably Bieber's in over Timberlake. Why? I think he's just, he's, I think he's more about the culture and nothing wrong with Justin this There's isn't a put nothing down wrong with Justin. but I'm just saying who's getting in first is Bieber say less here we go Miley Cyrus or Britney Spears neither but why I, I yeah I don't think they've had sweet potato pie pecan pie either yeah but it was store-bought say less Jack oh, Hart. why you do this to me, bro? Yeah, yeah, Why you do this yeah, to me, bro? Yeah, yeah. I thought Joe Burrow. Yeah. Joe Burrow's going in for everybody, bro. Anybody. You talking about a lifelong Bengals fan. You got me going now, bro. Look. Let me smoke this, bitch. Look, look. Let me get that, me get that burrow. Look. Hey, you know what's crazy? So I smoke cigars, and it's just like, ah, uh, it's affecting your health. Joe Burrow looks so cool smoking his cigar. It's cool like, and everything, bro. Bro. You talking about, look, you talking about Doc? You know your career. That's a like, movie star right there. Like. But you know, and I don't know if you know this, like I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a football fan. Mm -hmm. You, you and him, very similar mm. careers if you think about it. Why think about say? this. You both started at powerhouse schools, right? Mm -hmm. Florida, Ohio State. Okay. Right? Both, for whatever reason, left. didn't work out. Left. Correct. Both went to an SEC school, not a traditional powerhouse, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a doubt the whole year the stars were aligning. Even when you was down against Alabama, you was going to come back and win. Mm -hmm. it was a doubt, there wasn't a doubt in my mind you guys were winning the national title that year. Mm -hmm. Look at Joe Burrow. Goes to LSU. They're good, but they're not traditionally good every year. Correct. Does the same thing. Both been to a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. 
both lost in the Super Bowl. Sorry about that. Yeah. And uh, but it's, it's very similar. Both put a, put a whole city on their back. That part. But the thing that I respect about Joe is, bro, he's him. You know, cool as a. You know what I mean? I have, I've never met him. You know what I'm saying? I, I, Dude, I would, man. I would cuddle with him. I would. With Joe Burrow? Yeah. Okay. If I go to prison, that's who I want is my celly. Yeah. We're not going to do nothing, but I'd cuddle with him. Just talk. That's it. Spill. Just whisper. Yo. That's how much I love Joe Burrow. Yo, Joe. What's up? <laughs> Moving around. My next dog. I'm watch my next dog that I buy. My name is JJ Joseph Jamar. Mm. That part. Right along. Man, you should have stopped at that one. I know. I I don't even care anymore. Look, we got Iggy Azalea or Coco. Coco. She's been married to Ice T, man. She's been. I mean, you, you. She's been my C for over 20 years. Can we? Can we talk about something though? We ain't never seen them have a public. Issue. He's what is he? Twenty years older than her. Yeah. So uh, he was I, I, done. He was like, Nah, I'm not. I'm not playing yeah. the field no more. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm good. I'm settled. You know. So yeah, I think it's the real deal. I, th- I don't think that you're ever gonna get a scandal out of them too. Yeah. I think but they the keep deal. it within themselves though. But look, look, different version of scandals. If anything can be consensual within a marriage, if two people consent to it, correct. You know what I mean? Cheating is different. Cheating yeah. if different situations yeah what you may call cheating they may not call cheating or what they call cheating may not be what you call why you bringing up my divorce i'm going there next (laughs) (laughs) here we go (laughs) chloe kardashian or chris jenner we'll go with chloe why i mean look at the track record she's had a lot of brothers in her Chris? She's had some brothers. Chloe's confirmed it. She got babies. Raw. Mm. (laughs) I think if you get hit raw and get pregnant by a brother, you're allowed to cook out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't bring anything to it. Just show it. Now, the question the question is, the question is. This is a real life for you. What's your go-to recipe or what do you bring to the cookout? Me? Yes. Water. <sighs> I'm, not, I'm not being that dude. You made this, get yeah. out. Yeah. No. The best thing for a white person to do at a cookout is compliment the food. Mm. Don't bring it. But it got to come off as yeah, genuine. Like, oh, not my disingenuous. God. What did you put in this? Yeah. And enjoy it. Yeah. Hype them up. First time I ever, first time I ever had to experience like a black function mm-hmm. was I first got to LA and my one of my first roommates there was a brother. Man, I miss that guy. He's locked up right now. Boy. My dude. But uh he I never forget it was a Monday and I was at the la- I was at the improv. Thursday's Thanksgiving. He was like, hey, man, what you doing for Thanksgiving? I don't know nobody in L.A. like that. Like, I know people, but not enough to invite, right. get invited to Thanksgiving. And he's just like, hey, man, what, come by the house, man. You ain't doing nothing. I was like, because I was going to be, I literally going to be by myself on Thanksgiving. Right. And I didn't know he lived in Compton. I didn't know he was part of the that gang. Right. I didn't know. It was just a dude that, I, we was he cool. He was a good dude. That's not, he wasn't I showed that. up. This this before cell phones like mm-hmm. that. Some people had them, not everybody had them, late 90s. Right. I just knocked. He told me to show up at like 3 o'clock on Thursday. I showed up at 3 o'clock and knocked. I'll never answer the door. He goes, you came? I was what? like, you invited me. Wow. And I, when I got there, I was riding around like, I don't know if you've ever been through Compton, but if nobody's out, you don't know there's, it could be dangerous or it's the hood. It's just houses. Correct. I was like, so it's Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. There wasn't brothers outside hanging out. With I'm flag. just driving through a neighborhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Then it got dark. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I got to go. You got to go. Woo, oh, yeah. the dominoes came out. I said, this is not my game. Yeah, brothers. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody got some checkers? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Boom, here we go. Next one is Bob Ross or Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers. Mm. That's. I mean, he was about the culture before the culture. Read you know a Rainbow? I mean, did you see the movie with I Tom Hanks? Mm-mm. I didn't realize how much he did for black people. Wow. 
Like, he was the first one to, like, there was, it's such a little thing, but such a big thing. You're talking about late 60s, early 70s. Like, he was the first one. He they he had the little baby pool in the his front yard, and he, he took his shoes off, and he put his feet in there with, with a black guy. And they were, it was something he was trying to teach us. Right. But the fact that he did it, could have did it with a white guy, us. did it with a black guy, right. barefoot, and they're just like, you know, it's almost like physical contact was like ah! taboo. Yeah. He was the first one to do stuff like that. So he's got to be in it. Always, Say Mr. Like. Rogers. Who don't like Mr. Rogers? So, I do. And everybody knows him. Not everybody knows Bob Ross. That's a fact. You know the hair, but you'd be like, oh, that's a boy that paints. Yeah. You know Mr. Rogers. That's a fact. Post Malone or 6 9 This is easy. Post, baby. Post. Like post. post is so good. Donald Trump. Ooh. Or George Bush. Ooh. George Ooh. W. Bush. Yeah. It's weird. It's, it's a weird thing because if you look at Trump before he ran for president, mm. he wins this in a landslide. Right. Now they ran for president and everything just kind of went left. And then Bush... It was the same way. Right. When he was a president, remember Kanye? George Bush don't care about black people. Right. And then when he got out of office, we realized, oh, he was kind of a he was kind of like a, a puppet yeah. almost. He really wasn't making the decisions. He was yeah. just, you know what I mean? Right. The face. He's, he was Biden. Mm. Is who he was. For Republicans. So who we letting in? Oh man. Here's the thing. If I say Trump, you're, I'm uninvited. You're canceled. So I'm gonna say Bush. Let's just uh, to save. Let's just not let neither one of them in. Oh, I forgot neither's an option. That is. My fault. I forgot this was an easy one. Uh -uh. We, got, we got talking so much. Yeah, I yeah, forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Let her this. Yeah. Swear. I know she's going to bring something good to eat, yeah. too. Neither. Ooh. No, no, I'm talking about Bush and Trump. Right. Oh, that Lars Pippen and. Lars, Larsa Pippen and Kim K. Oh, wow. It's, oh. it's got to be Kim. Why? Let, let's look at the prison reform. Let's get deep. Oh, yeah. That right there, that gets to the cookout. I thought you was going to go through the knees, like, because both of them got a good rapport of being with brothers. brothers. Now, the prison reform, that, that gets her in. She, I, mean, I think she's really about that. Like, it doesn't matter if you say if she's smart or not or how could she. It's just that's in her heart. No, yeah. like, I seen what she's done, and it's very impactful. It's empowering to be honest with you. Yeah. Gorgeous, beyond measure, both of them, really. I they think both could get in, but if you ask who's getting in first, yeah. it's definitely Kim. Yeah. She's yeah, Kim. A, say less. Yeah. No, neither. But they, we could still listen to a couple of songs. Now, Bill, <laughs> the, now the question is Bill Cosby or R. Kelly, right? Bill yeah. Cosby, neither is coming to cookout, bro. Like, One, I'm, I'm, I don't trust either of them around any women. No. Around girls. Girl, well, Kazi wasn't underage. It was anybody could get it. Yeah. That's a fact. Here's a problem. They're in the room. Cosby's drugging the mom, and R. Kelly's howling at the daughter. <laughs> playing spade. Uh, <laughs> you playing spade. You over here. Cosby playing bad. spades. He's like, he's like this. Ah. R. Kelly's going, ah. wow, that cart was really hit hard on the table. Right. Look. Hard on the table. Look. Look. <laughs> Cosby playing, Cosby playing spades. Dog on uh, R. Kelly Cosby playing, playing Uno. Spades. Cosby's in the kitchen serving drinks. The <laughs> All right. Well, Neither. that's it. It's over with. Over with. Nan, one of yours. But so we can take, we can, we can remove Cosby and R. Kelly and bring on Justin Timberlake because we went to we kicked Justin out. He could come. We could take Justin and Bieber and. Or whatever. Yeah, that's good because then we can listen to his music and there's no guilty feelings. I'll be on a suit and tight like all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about, you know, obviously where we are in, in, in divorce and, and things like that. And I want to, I don't want to dwell on one thing more than anything. I just want to harp on just, you know, where you are with it and just how you feel about everything. The divorce? Um, well, it's final. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, it's, it's, it's weird because nobody gets into a marriage thinking they're going to get divorced. Right. You also don't get into a marriage thinking the, the you know, like the passion leaves. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it came down to is the, we, we just were roommates. Right. So I don't wish 
bad things on her. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to meet somebody and be happy right. and everything else. So it's just like I wanted to. I wanted it to be quiet and nobody would ever find out. But that's not what happened right. for for a variety of reasons. That's not what happened. Mm-hmm. So I'm at a point now where I'm just like, uh, you know, I'm I'm. I wanted the divorce, so I was like, I'm, you know, this is what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And I, there was not one day where I said, maybe I'm making a mistake. I was, I knew it. And I've, I've heard people say that. Cause you, but it can't, did, did it come off of a long time? Or was it just something where it's just like, you made a decision within a year? Or was this a cumulative of a long time? Oh, no, it was building. It was building. There was a couple separations that nobody knew about. But could you guys work? From it though, because I'm an opponent of love. You feel me? Yeah. Like I'm not married, never been married. Uh, I plan on. I think my my stance on marriage is my fear of divorce is higher than my want to to get married. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's a scary thought. And it's like if I'm fearing divorce, because I know, like you just said, it. You don't get with somebody and you just automatically think, like, damn, like what this prenup got? Like I got to be protected. But people in my situation you don't necessarily know what that monster could turn into if you don't, if, if, if that's never an emotion that you kind of see. Mm-hmm. Like, a woman's rage? Trust me. A black woman's rage? Dude. Bruh. From Oakland? Ugh. Name was Kenya? Mm. I, didn't, I didn't get with Hillary Banks, bro. Yeah. I went the pro-black. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, th- does it affect does it affect your children? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't spoken to them in a couple of years because they're just you know they I don't I, I wish I knew what was going through them mentally. We just haven't talked because you know I I kind of left and Ooh. so you're kind of just left out there like you know hopefully they'll come around. You know, I talked so you to you still haven't talked to your Mm-mm. children. No, it's been about two years. You know. What? And you know, like, because I wasn't a deadbeat dad. Yeah. Like, I was active. Hands on. Hands you know? on. There was and a, how many kids do you have? We have two. Okay. And we, I have a, a stepson. Okay. He's older. Um, so I, when we got together, he was seven. We got married. He was nine. He was, no, he was 11 when we got married. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was 11 when we got married. Um, so I raised him. Right. And then we yeah, raised our two. To- Y'all had, had two, two together. together. Okay, and so three hers, in total. Yeah, three total. Okay. Yeah, so it's just, I, I wish I knew mentally where they were. I just, I don't know. Right. I keep reaching out, but it's just, it's a, it's a closed door right now. Yeah. And that, that's the hardest part, because if I was, like, not involved, mm-hmm. and, and just to be blunt, if I stayed for them for a lot of times, like, I was really, like, it, you, you feel selfish for getting a divorce because you want to be happy. Mm-hmm. So you stay somewhat unhappy. I'm not gonna, it's not like I went home and I was just miserable and I hated it. It wasn't that. It was just the passion wasn't there anymore. Right. So I stayed in it for them, you know, because you read so many statistics of how broken homes, right. the girls become promiscuous, <laughs> depression, all that other right. stuff. She's like, okay, I got to put my own stuff aside and like try to stick this out right. with them. So I think when you go through divorce, when you look back on it, you'd be like, I could have did that different. I could have did that different. Yeah. But I don't think anything was, they didn't have like a, um, they didn't have like a, uh, there was no emotional or physical abuse. Mm. There was none of that. They had, a, they had, I think they had a, a good childhood. What's the age groups? Uh, well, my daughter's 20 and my son's 22 right now. Okay. So they're older, but and this is two years ago. Right. So when, when the, quote unquote she had the fan. She was a freshman okay. at AT and he's still at the house. So she's a junior now. Right. I'm kind of missing the whole college experience right now with her. Yeah. You know? I, if and I'm walking lightly. All right. And I want to share to you in, in this platform my experience. Right. Never never was married, but I had a family. Mm-hmm. Right. And I had a child outside of my relationship. Right. During the relationship? During the relationship. Okay. Something that at that time was a big mistake. Now, my son's in this world now, and that's the best thing that has ever happened to me as far as an acceptance for me. Because it forced me to start saying, 
I live for my children. I don't live for what the expectations of Cam is. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because when I first when I first came around Shakira, she was five years old, and that's when me and her mom started dating. And she was one of those bad baby kids. Where it's like, you ain't my daddy. And I'm like, I'm this Whoa. big dude that I'm like, man, you'll make me feel this small because of that. But she didn't know. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I had to be patient to love her, you know what I'm saying? And to love on her, to implement the things that I knew was right versus what's wrong, but also letting her mom instill those same things. So when we separated, it was like, I had to start all the way over again, you know what I'm saying? And I just I just asked you to just be patient through that process and don't change. Like, they're getting those text messages. They're getting those phone calls. They're getting everything, but the worst thing that you can do, and I always talk to to dudes all the time that don't have relationships with their with their seeds and I'm like bro just it's just like a it's just like a rock you just keep hitting it yeah and when they come around I promise you it's going to be worth it yeah you know what I'm saying because you see something that you grow like a flower and whether certain things happen or not I think growth in a relationship, whether it's your ex or not, you always want to do what's right for your children because you don't want them to, to catch a straight bullet that was intended for you or for her. And they're the ones that's being affected by it. And I can't say it's going to take a year. I can't tell you it's going to take five years. I could, But what I can tell you is keep showing up in their lives because they may not know how to express themselves yet. Yeah, and and you know, I uh, it's I hurt their mom. Mm-hmm. However, you want to look at it, right? And that's probably why I stayed in the marriage longer than what I probably should have, mm-hmm. is because I didn't want to hurt nobody. Right. I didn't know it was gonna turn like this. Right. You know, it, might, it probably would be easier to process if I wasn't around. Right. If I didn't when they were growing up, revolved my entire schedule around them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I never missed a birthday. Mm -hmm. And I got a hard schedule. You know, there were times I would have a show and one city fly back just to blow out the cake with them and then fly back to another city. And I'm not not flying private. I'm on regular airlines Mm -hmm. hustling because I I didn't want to look back and be like, he missed my birthday. Right. So it wasn't a time... And I'm not doing it for a pat on the back. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying it might be easier if, if it was like I wasn't around a deadbeat. I could be like, ah, but it's different now. I'm but like, a, yo, a, I was there. Another thing, too, that I would say, too, we're in different spaces in our relationship. In regard, and I'm not talking about you and me. I'm talking about me and the mom. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of women don't understand you're not affecting me you're not only affecting me when I don't get to see my children, you're affecting the child as well. You know what I'm saying? And I think if you can have a healthy co-parenting relationship, right. that's key. So to that, I would just say, bro, if you can have a healthy relationship with, put our emotions aside. Like, did I do what I did to you? Whatever. But we have to come together and say, what's best for our children? Because they being affected by it in more ways than not. Because they're going to hold that same trauma for years and years. And who knows what it will come from it rather than if you were in their lives to be able to help and cope them through. Like my biggest fear is, and I tell my daughter this, I said, baby, I'm protecting you from guys like me. Hmm. Right? And she's like, no, oh, daddy, what you, what you mean by that? I'm like. But boy, I wasn't I wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like knowing good and well, I'm tearing the dog on hinges off of yeah. all the doors, you know? But for her, it's my job as a as a father to teach my daughter those things to, to equip her. So when she does go to college or when she does go into the real world, she's equipped with that thing where it's like, nah. You ain't the dude for me. You know what right. I'm saying? She gonna have, she gonna skin her knee every now and then. And you wanna be a positive force for her to be able to say, I can go to my dad for this type of expertise. That's and that honestly is the worst. The worst of it is I don't think we'd ever we we weren't we were never as close as we were when when I left. Mm. 
Like we were, because you go through the age where I read somewhere, like when you go through divorce, it's like when kids are young, they idolize their dad. Mm -hmm. Then when the divorce happens, they demonize them. Mm. And then when the dust settles, they humanize them. Mm. So right now I'm in the demonized stage. That's clearly. a fact. And the, the bad part was it was like, God, we were so good. Mm -hmm. We were so good. And then the, it hit the fan and it just went for, for a number of reasons. But the, 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 the real reason is I, I hurt their mom or yeah, whatever. That's you know, fact. That, that's what it was. That's, it's a defense mechanism more you know. than anything. But if you, can, if you could penetrate the healthiness with the co-parenting, where it's like, bro, I don't have no jurisdiction between your knees no more. Like, whoever you date, cool. Like, right. that's, I want you happy. But don't punish me by not letting me, right? I still want to, and they're old enough, right? I'm hearing 22, right? So they're old enough to make their own decisions. But what can't happen is like, man, she don't want to hear from me, but she does. He don't want to hear from me, but he does. And you're never going to know until you stay consistent. And I just have to do that for each one of my kids, bro. So... Please keep at it. Yeah. I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. Hope they come around. Absolutely. Man, so look, as we end things here at Funky Friday, we're going to go in unison. We're going to start with this camera, and then we're going to go to this camera, and then we're going to finish with that camera right there. Here we go. You got one finger? E.T. <laughs> Here we go. One finger. One pinky. One thumb. One love. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Ah, I got carpal tunnel. That was hard. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. You guys got hand sanitizer? <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about breaking look, the hinges off of women. Yeah, look. I don't know where that hand's been. <laughs> Come on, bro.